Hello, and welcome to the most excellent 80s movies podcast. It's the podcast where a filmmaker, a comedian, and their wonderful guests just slowly climb the pyramid of 80s movies that we think we love or might have missed, uh, watching with these our modern eyes to see how the movies hold up or don't. This is Beastmaster, a movie from 1982. It was foretold by witches. It was conceived through sorcery. And it was to be destroyed by all that is evil. But the courage of one mortal saved it. And so, into an age of darkness, in a time of mysticism, sacrifice, and plunder, there came the only light, the Beast Master. Born with the strength of a black tiger, the courage of an eagle, the power that made him more than any hero. Any lover. He was lord and master over all beasts. He was the beast master. Behold the wonder, the horror, the fantasy, the challenge of the one warrior they call the beast master. Mark Singer is Dar. Daniel Roberts is Carrie. Rip Torn is Mayak. John Amos is Seth. Together they take us on a fascinating journey back into unexplored times. Conquer your fears. Face the unknown. And discover the incredible link between man, animal, and all that is phantasmagorical in the world of dungeons, dragons, and Dar. The Beast Master. The epic adventure of a new kind of hero. The world between dungeons, dragons, and Dar. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I, I like how they did Mark Singer as Dar, the Beast Master. Tanya Roberts as Kiri and John Amos as Seth. <laughs> and Rip Torn. Yes. <laughs> so my mom's name is Darlene, and so everyone calls her Dar. And every time I heard that, I was just like, Mom? Mom, are you the Beastmaster? And I never knew. <laughs> um, hi, I'm Chrissy Lenz, uh, uh, the director of the Neighborhood Comedy Theater. And with me, as always, is filmmaker... Uh, no, it's always see whenever you leave out my name, it's like, is it supposed to be me who's talking? I for, like I forget who our guest is, Nathan Blackwell. Oh, thank yes. you. Yes, it's a weird one. <laughs> it is. I think, it's weird. I think maybe uh, uh, moving forward, I say if you say their name, then they can say hi. I'm blah 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 blah. I feel like that. Did I say their name. Yeah, and with us as always is Nathan Blackwell, and then blah blah blah. Does that make sense? Oh, okay. Sure, so you don't like it when I make you say your name. Well, I notice any other show that does that, there's always an awkward pause. It's like, oh, is it my turn to talk? <laughs> right, so we're saying we don't want the awkward pause. Uh, well, I guess uh, we can. I'm... I mean, this all this conversation is in the podcast. Yeah, it is, for sure. Well, it's let's okay. see what happens when we say uh, <laughs> that today our special guest... Let's... Uh, is is comedian and podcaster Matt Alspa. <laughs> Hello, <laughs> thank you, Matt. That that's a, a per- that's a point for Nathan. Yes, uh, indeed. Unless people, I'm, so- really I'm like- sorry, my comedy <laughs> brain kicked in. Yes, I love it. <laughs> oh, wonderful! Of uh, the very very cool Saturday Night Characters podcast, which I highly recommend. It's a a deep dive into um, the various characters across all of Saturday Night Live. Um, and we all watched Beastmaster. I, I've i never seen this movie. Um, I'm guessing that Nathan has. 
so I am ashamed that I haven't seen Beastmaster. <gasps> wow. Um, I am ashamed. Okay. And I mean, yeah, yeah. And um, I mean, and this was in that perfect zone of, of again, so I, I didn't grow up with HBO, which HBO stands for Hey Beastmaster's on. Yeah. Um, but <laughs> I, I, I remember seeing promos for it all the time. It was like that midday slot. It, there, there was kind of like the reason why Beastmaster was on HBO, along with like I, you know, kind of throw in like w- other movies that were kind of like the midday movies. It was like Swamp Thing or Red Sonia or like Masters of the Universe, oh, is because yeah. these were like the cheapest movies to play. <laughs> and then in their primetime slots, they yes. would do stuff like like the Three Amigos or Romancing the Stone. Well, I'm happy to do a podcast with y'all and have you watch the Beastmaster because I kind of chose this a little bit as a joke, but (laughs) it's like I came up with a list and I threw Beastmaster on because, you know, for any list, you just got to have one for you. And lo and behold, that's what Chrissy said. Let's do it. (laughs) And I'm so happy because I got to watch something I haven't watched in 25 years. Oh, yeah. (laughs) Yeah, and like, of course, I've never sat down and seen it, but but like Nathan said, this movie was always on TV, so it's very like it feels familiar and it's very recognizable, like all of the individual pieces of the puzzle. Um, but to put them all together is just truly a baffling um, <laughs> gift, I think. Um, mm-hmm. So this is. I'm so glad we lived this long to podcast about Beastmaster. <laughs> it's such a it, like I love that you mentioned Red Sonia because like yeah it's immediately in that genre it's very very crawl yeah it, it's that rare mid 80s sword and sorcery style movie to where it's still I feel following kind of in the wake of Star Wars at least that's why they, they were all greenlit I mean that kind of stuff existed in like in other mediums, like on in like obviously Dungeons and Dragons, but like in books and like art, art and things like that, like Frank Frazetta and like, you know, um, like the Conan comics and books and things like that, that existed. But I felt like there was this wave, this ripple effect of, of star Wars and things getting all these things getting greenlit because of it, you know, yeah. and all the, and go moving in different trees. Like you had the obvious like Star Wars sci-fi ripoff stuff. And then you had like, well, let's just do like Greek mythology and sword and sorcery and dragons and people in loincloths. And it's all kind of like, oh, there's a niche to fill now. Yeah. Um, so was this like a favorite of yours, Matt, or like, how did you find this? So the Beastmaster movie was very much something I watched as a kid because, you know, to Nathan's point, it was on. And as a kid, just channel surfing (laughs) back in like 91, 92, I was kind of, I guess, waiting for a parent to walk in the room and be like, what is this? But like, they didn't show up. So I just kept watching. Yeah, yeah, very well, much like looking over my shoulder, like whoa. There's just <laughs> and enough like boobs. and again to Nathan's. There's like just enough boobs for it to be like a little mm-hmm. salacious. Yeah, and, like, just enough upper thigh. Like <laughs> everyone well, was sporting such loincloths. I wrote down a note here that um, none of these costumes complimented any humans. but it's like again to nathan's point before about things getting greenlit because star wars was just this after effect we were still feeling in the industry it's like for star wars i could tell you like oh my uncle said hey we're gonna watch star wars like someone brings you into it you just kind of discover beastmaster one day flipping (laughs) through the channels a a beastmaster (laughs) finds you exactly and and they found seven-year-old matt like what is this vampire looking thing (laughs) 
Yeah, what even is everything is the question you have to be asking yourself. And that's like, I I feel like you're so right. When you look at the people and the costumes and like the hair and the makeup and and the set design, it all looks like a drawing that somebody did, (laughs) you know, like, and then you see it in real life and you're like, oh, well, that's why it's comic books and, and art and posters that are on like some stoner's wall is because like, you can't wear that in real life as a real human and move your body within mm-hmm. all these leather straps and 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 leather diapers and um, right. It's not like, like it's historically accurate outfit. Right. <laughs> there's no there's no battle strategy in the outfits that they're wearing and the women in the like barely there one piece that's like an apron that's like just like the the barest skirt that's all ripped in just all the places where someone would sketch that and it's like yeah but a a human person can't wear that and then walk around like it just can't happen um so basically this is the story of Macbeth and Moses like smooshed (laughs) into a renaissance festival (laughs) um because the beginning is rip torn and his three um, sexy butterface witches, <laughs> who are like, uh-huh. <laughs> they're very sexy from like the neck down, and they're like wiggling around their cauldron. But you see their faces, and their faces are like pillowcases. It's like they're like grotesque and and like acid dripped, and like yeah, they've they've got issues, but you know nothing a good pillowcase couldn't fix well but that's what i mean is like it looks and- like they look old and they look droopy but they also look like they have fabric am i wrong about that like yeah no and and this. even the direction of their introduction y- you're supposed to look at these uh, the bodies and be like oh my god what is this but right away as you're watching you're like oh no what's wrong with them Something's wrong with their face. (laughs) And it's bad. It's bad. Because if if they were truly three good-looking, sexy witches, the movie would be about them. It wouldn't be about some weirdo. Uh, (laughs) I think there is a movie about that. But then, like you said, it it has that Macbethian-type warning. (laughs) And it's just like, I can't believe as you're watching it, yeah, I'm sorry. I'm sorry. Go ahead. It's your podcast. I'll shut up until I'm told to talk. <laughs> no, no, no. Never shut up. Jump in. Jump in at any moment because all we're going to do is like plod through what happens in this movie. So like you jump in any old time. Um, but they basically tell him you, there's yeah. a baby and you have to kill the baby before it's born. In or it will kill this unborn you. baby. Right. And Rip Torn okay. right away very much says, well, I will kill this baby. Okay. Um, I think it's like, I think that, yeah, the internet is just a little bit wonky, but usually if we just like pause for a minute, it, it all comes, sort of comes back. Okay. So we were, cool. we were talking about the unborn baby bit. <laughs> the unborn baby gag. <laughs> Um. So, like that guy's the king, right? So there's Rip Torn and his and his sexy witches, but then the guy that comes in, the beardy guy, is the king, and they're very open. He's just like, "There's an unborn baby I've got to kill. Heads up, it's yours." Am I getting this right? I'm not even sure that I am. <laughs> um. No, I I think I think you're getting it better than the movie got it. Yeah, what I wish would have happened because they brought in basically he he goes for like a stealth abortion to or to, to steal their baby, but by zapping yeah. it into a yeah, like, cow? cow. Yeah, I and I wish that the cow had been pregnant too, so it was like a switcheroo. Yeah, so she would have given birth to a cow. But basically, as they're sleeping, he brings in a cow to zap their baby into the cow. Right. And, like, he told them he was going to do that. <laughs> right. I mean, he sent them an email earlier the day, and they didn't check. 
He was like, basically, I'm gonna get your baby. Uh huh. And yeah, he... no. At the beginning, he rep he got reprimanded for you know going over the line and sac- trying to sacrifice a baby for them. Like at this point, he was a loyal employee, you know, who got reprimanded in the beginning. Yeah, and he's like, no, I'm just gonna keep doing this, even though he said no. Obviously, not a fireable offense, you know. So what was why did those two guys hang themselves? Like there's a moment where like they're having a tense moment and then Riptorn looks at his two guys and then they hang themselves. What oh I think it was one of those like classic I shall show you how loyal my minions are and now I should command yeah. them to kill themselves. Classic that, move. That's such a waste. Yeah. It's like <laughs> er, early on in this whole movie, everything is just like, I'll show you the move that I could do, but there's really no, like, wait, do we need to see that? Like, let's just keep finding out who these characters are. But no, it's just like, hey, let's see this person hang his servants. Let's see this cow suddenly becoming pregnated. And it's like, yeah. you're sacrificing whatever story you have in Beastmaster for these very, mm-hmm. like, shoddy, striking visuals that's like what ultimately drew me in as a kid was the simple fact of like whoa a cow's pregnant Uh, well i think there's a reason why some of these things got phased out uh, (laughs) in history was is that how he got his his powers is because he got zapped into a cow like the cow like imbued him with the beast master ring no i well I think he got his power. He was more of a chosen one, and maybe there was some synergy with the cow thing. I don't know. I mean, that could be possible. Didn't seem like a special cow. No, it was just that? a cow. Yeah. And I I think that it was literally just like, well, we need, we need to find out how this guy is connected to animals. And they literally, right. like, what's a good special effect that would be like, whoa, even though it does not come out good? Because as the movie progress- progresses, and not to jump ahead too much, but it's literally just like, jump we're away. not resolving the previous thing, and they just keep showing you, like, and now we're here. It's like, but uh-huh. wait. So, like, when he has that yeah. scene that follows shortly where he's talking to a beer, a bear, it's just like, so I know he's a beast master because <laughs> of the title, but nothing I've seen on the screen right. is really telling me why. <laughs> yeah. Let's yeah. be clear. the The ideal scenario to 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 watch Beastmaster is like you put it up like on a like a projector on a wall at a party, okay. and people are watching in like an eighty a hundred and eighty second moments, you know, or or you're yes. watching it, you know, coming and going, or as the backdrop like on loop. Like as you're playing like D and D, or just having like a, a like you're at, you're at some place like the last Starfighter arcade, to where you're kind of sure. immersing yourself in the the you know that era. And and again, like I feel like moment to moment, there's a lot of fun bits, but then when you're forced to string them together, then it becomes tougher to comprehend a pattern. Well- and this movie is really long in that way that like I kept having to pause it and then like go do stuff and then come back and, and I would look at and you know Amazon will tell you like how much is left and I'd be like no there can't possibly be an hour and 40 minutes left. Right. They killed the main bad yes. guy and there's 20 minutes left. You've got to be kidding me. Y- y- um, yeah. Go ahead. It, it's very much like when I watched this uh, about a week ago for preparation I realized that this is the first time I ever watched Beastmaster beginning, middle, and end all the way through. With your face. And, yeah. and, it and was as a, an adult. And as an adult, which is a double whammy of like, hey, <laughs> like, boy, you chose one. <laughs> but yeah, you dude, it's, one shot. <laughs> it's, it's exactly your point of like, this is not meant to be watched, even though in 1982, this was meant to be watched. <laughs> I love that as the review for a movie. This is not meant to be watched. <laughs> <laughs> Playing in the background. Do other things with yeah. your friends. <laughs> or like just or just plan to like or or like really, really, really watch it with somebody who you will have a great time really, really watching it with. Um like just somebody who's gonna be like, Oh yeah. What? Under because, su- uh, under under uh, the right circumstances or substances, 
you right. know, it's a really good time. It's a good movie to drink beer to. And, oh, sure. You know, maybe you're not 100% focusing on the movie. That's okay. You know. Um, well, it, and it's like everything's so slow. Like, I feel like this movie could have been much shorter. Like, if it had, if a, a modern person got their hands on it and, like, made right. the fights go faster. Because every single fight, whether it's a bear fighting a, a neighbor or um, a ferret <laughs> fighting a bad guy or... Or, or a, a, a long sequence of him practicing with a log on a mountaintop. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Like, everything could just be a little bit quicker. Like, even at the very end, at the very climax, where R- Rip Torn is, like, coming up behind him to get him, that he's sneaking up so goddamn slowly. <laughs> And Dar is just standing there. Yeah. It's like, yeah. speed it up a little. There's no sense of urgency to any of these characters. Um, so basically... No, no, Dar... but they they just keep going and going. <laughs> they just keep going and going. So Dar gets sort of um, adopted by a, a guy, and then a mil- years go by, and... Here's what confused me too. This movie suffers from Witcher syndrome, which is like there are too many things, and all of the things have separate names, and they do separate stuff and have different rules. So he's from the village of Urhapur, and he's got to go to the Valley of Blur Blur so that he can find <laughs> the meaning of whatever to go face Marak. And the Blarg Blargs, so that he can face the with June the help of face. Seth, <laughs> with Seth, yeah. So there's too many things. It's like once you defeat Rip Torn, you still haven't defeated the, the evil backstory bad guys, right? So why were those two yeah. different things? Why weren't they all one thing? There's no. I, we don't have the answer. I, I have no answer that could help. I, I'm just guessing maybe there was some producer who was like, listen, you guys came in 6,000 under budget. We got a bunch of explosives. Did you use those characters from minute 18? Let's have them yeah. come back and light a huge fire and we'll end it like that. Yeah. We can't use these hats once. <laughs> we got to use these hats yeah. twice. <laughs> Conan solved this by having like the Raiders and the main bad guy be from the same group. Right. You know, that's, and that's exactly team. what I was expecting. Like like yeah. that Rip Torn was basically the James Earl Jones of this universe. And it's shocking um, that and- <laughs> these movies like this Beastmaster and Conan came out like the same year. It was impossible for like Beastmaster yes. to rip off Conan. Apparently the, it was just in the zeitgeist. You know, it was. The, the, we were the, just into it because if you look at it, there's so there's so many similar moments. Yes, yes, but I don't, and maybe I'm just wrong, but I don't remember quite as many toddlers being thrown into lava pits. Right. Oh head. my god. There's and and like, that's another thing about this movie. It. I know we've gotten away from, like, we've gotten away from following through with the plot because, frankly, folks. This is where I think in all of our viewing, we viewing it got away from the plot. And you just start to see these striking moments where a toddler is hoisted in the air. And as I'm watching it, I just can't help but to think, like, is there a safety coordinator here? Because that kid looks like he's really getting hurt. Yeah. He's really like, please don't throw me in the lava pit. Only three children were harmed in the making of this movie. But But they they all deserved it. Yeah. They toss oh, the first baby, that. no prob whatsoever. But by the time they get to that second baby, they're like, okay, uh, maybe we should do something. Plus, they say that he's the master of all beasts, and he's really just the master of four beasts. Two ferrets, mm. A, mm. a bird, and a cat. It's, it's, a, it's, a, it's a large cat. It is, but it's not like and, every and animal. And you could even add the fifth with... You know, you could even add a fifth with that bear at the beginning, but he's not really mastering it. He's just kind of like, hey, no. man, leave the neighbor alone. That, <gasps> that was the, yeah, the bear was the tutorial level. <laughs> and then once he had 
achieved all four of his companion slots, then he couldn't get any more animals at that point. Right. He could, he would have to like yeah. eliminate one. To have. Yeah. He'd he'd have to he'd have to trash them and then get like like if there's a Pokemon Go, he get like ferret candy in re- in return, mm-hmm. and then he'd have to get some more Pokemon. Yeah. Um, but it would be like he could solve a lot more problems if it was just like no any animal that is within a hundred yards of me. Yeah, he didn't really use it the, his power that often, other than to kind of recruit his animal friends, and then they were kind of like buddies that would help him out. Yeah, you know, right? It's it's his superhero power, and they never use it really. Like the the simple phrase in improv: "If this is true, what else is true?" Like, yeah. nobody at this time heard that. So they saw in the paper, yeah. well, there's three animals that he could work with. And, like, nobody said, well, <laughs> well, well what about this right. other one? Like, a wolf. No, it's not yeah. on the page. If there were moments to where, like, he w- they were trying to, to sneak around, and there was a snake in the other room, and he takes control of the snake just to kind of observe what's going on in the room. Or, you know, he, if if... If he encountered additional animals and he was able to momentarily take over, like, you know, what, like the perfect setup would be to give the bad guys like a, a, their own like vicious animal, like a like a wolf or something like that. And at, at a pivotal ah, yeah. point, he like makes a connection with it and and him and the wolf are, are cool, you know. So they get this eyeball ring that like opens its eye when it's spying on you and closes its eye when it's not, which seems very risky. Uh, But that's how they watch every (laughs) single thing that they do. Um, But yeah, if they had some kind of thing where he could watch them all the time, like even just a pet, like one of them had like a pet, that would be cute. But I did like the element of like having to solve the puzzles like having to solve if this was a video game puzzles like well, how do i use my animals i'm going to use the ferrets to lower the branch and distract the guy and so that while it's chasing him the mm-hmm. cat is going to knock down the heavy thing and the eagle's going to fly around and keep watch it's like it's fun to solve that puzzle mm-hmm. that they're trying to do um but that only mm. happens like twice that he's like really needs to use all in a two hour needs. movie. <laughs> yeah. Um, yeah. 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 Because where, they, where there's the, I mean, chaos. The real reason why that probably didn't happen more often is because it's expensive to train animals and that and so it, it slows down the production to a crawl to to have to get the tiger then, to do something. That's like the whole day. Then don't make a movie where the guy has a tiger that does things. <laughs> then make Beast Apprentice. Make it <laughs> obvious that he's not a master yet. Make it <laughs> make Conan and just be like, give him ten pounds more muscle, and let's forget this whole eagle situation. Um, there wasn't much. Well, it- like. It's like Beast Apprentice would just be, do you see that tiger over there? And then cut to a shot of a really pissed off tiger and then cut back to the actor. Yep. You need to control him one day. <laughs> and that's it. <laughs> Keep going. Cool. I'll write that down. Uh, so, but like, that was one thing that was, oh, I'm sorry, Chrissy. I was just no, going to no. say that was one thing that was very, very stuck out to me was this actor, Mark Singer, being cast in a sheet where they say, are you comfortable working with ferrets, eagles, and tigers painted black? Oh. It's like, yeah, sure. And then there's just shots of him walking side by side with a tiger like it's <laughs> totally part of the gig. Hollywood, baby. Yeah. 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 Was it a tiger painted black? Yes. And mm-hmm. and, and it, it the... <laughs> The, the paint on its face would keep getting worn off, so it changes back and forth. Why can't it just be a freaking tiger? <laughs> they, I guess they like the look of, like, a panther, and you can't really train panthers. You can train tigers. Like, you can't train leopards. Okay, that's the dumbest thing. I don't tigers know, like, like makeup. Panthers do not. <laughs> no. Oh, my God. Um, so, swing back around plot plot wise um at some point he sees a girl and apparently imprints on her like a werewolf because he's just like no i love that girl now 
Um, and he like tricks her. He's like, okay, okay, tiger that's painted black. We've got two gigs. We help the helpless and we trick women into making Guess out which <laughs> today is. <laughs> Um, and then he just like is fixated on her and wants to rescue her because mm-hmm. she's a slave of the Rip Torn people, right? right? The Rip the Rip Torns, right? <laughs> yes, yes. But she just was able to like go take a bath in the water fountain, uh, in the waterfall, yeah. rather. You know, with friends, not, with friends not against hygiene. Yeah, they're right. they're just whatever. <laughs> so he like gets really fixated on her, and then he meets some people along the way. Well, I mean, did you see what all the other women at this point look like? They're all, you know, sure, sexy, sexy below the collar, but up. Right. Ooh, a little rough. Ooh, Ooh yeah. So I mean, it comes at- into um, a guy and a kid, and the guy and the kid are like, oh, yeah, no, cool. Like, here's the thing. This happened, right. this happened, this happened, and this happened, and all these bad things happened. And he's like, yeah, 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 yeah. Um, so what about Yeah, they, the they bump into, girl? so they bump into Seth. Played mm-hmm. by John Amos. <laughs> mm-hmm. And I wrote down here, oh, John Amos has brought acting to the movie. Acting. Like he, yes. Like he's immediately on another level to yeah. everyone else. Yeah. Seriously. And a lot, I mean, this a lot. The, for me, this was the point where it feels like you could start watching the movie here. Like everything before <laughs> that, you don't uh-huh. need. That's this the is where. It, yeah, this is where it feels like it becomes a story where there's consequences and people interacting and moving towards something and not just like and a shot of a man on a mountain swinging a sword around. Mm-hmm. Yeah, well, and I thought I had a handle on what was going on before those guys showed up. But then I was like, wait, wait, that kid is the son of the king. So then who's this guy? <laughs> <laughs> uh huh. I thought this guy was the son of the king. Yeah, wait, uh, so this guy's just a dude? He's just a whatever. He's I'm a like, dude no, who I came to remember. us via cow. And he's yeah, got a, a tattoo on his hand, on his palm. With the cow. Um, but and then they're like, Yeah, the hot chick is our cousin. So we're gonna go rescue the king. And then we'll go rescue the cousin. Mm-hmm. So they do. They rescue the king from the Riptorns, who are making like super <laughs> soldiers by taking regular dudes, yes, and filling them up with goo, and then putting like spiked arm sleeves on them. Is that right? Correct. <laughs> yes, very much. They were very much. Exactly what you said. Something like a horror film meets WWF 1982 wrestler. Right. Yes. Uh-huh. Yes. They're like, oh no! Like you, like like in Dragon Slayer, you can't be a virgin in this kingdom, or you're in trouble. In this kingdom, you can't be like a beefcake, or then be like, oh, get that beefcake <laughs> scoop. <laughs> Go get him. Mm-hmm. Net. <laughs> We're gonna turn him into one of these zombie guys. Um, but the good news is zombie guys love to chase ferrets. Mm-hmm. So true. they rescue the yes, king. Yes, and ferrets are smarter than zombie guys. Um, if you played D&D, you would know this. Uh, and then the the king Zed is like, okay, here's a couple of things. None of them are thank you for saving me. The first one is get out of here, you weirdo <laughs> beast master. You're gross <laughs> And I hate you. You're a coward. Go yeah. crawl down a hole with your animals. <laughs> oh, burn. Thanks, blind a hole. Mm-hmm. Also, thanks, Dad. Thanks, the Daddy. P- and isn't he, isn't that dude, uh, you know, checking IMDb, wasn't, isn't that Sigmund Freud from Bill and Ted's Excellent Adventure? Don't you? Really? Is it really? I am not joking. Now I'm mad. <laughs> We're very disappointed in him. Very disappointed. He should have made a better choice. He should have. But it, it, um, it seems like that could be the moment where it's like, hey, we saved the king. It's over. No, 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 no. We are only an hour and 40 minutes in. Yeah, and the king, 
the king is a real d bag because he's like get out of here Beastmaster. i hate you and everything you stand for but then he's like let me describe my whole plan by the way i'm a king who's been captured for the last what 30 years let's all do what i say and everyone's just like yeah well, we're just gonna do what he says even if it makes the least amount of sense um he knows that the eyeball heard the whole plan and he's like too bad i'm oh, king. Yeah. doing it anyway so, so he makes this big plan and there's like a you know and then the 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 good guys say no we can't do it it's folly and he's like you guys are cowards you guys suck <laughs> you're friends I hate, with that guy and he's got ferrets i he's hate riptorns we're gonna do it even though we don't really have any warriors we're we're gonna do it and then it fades down to like the next day and then like you know discount buddy hackett is riding on a horse and he's like oh my god <laughs> dar it all failed yeah. You've got to save the only three yes. people who survived, which were your three friends. Yep. Oh, and the king. We so don't get to see the failure. It's like literally, wait, like it's wait, hold on. Did everyone die? Did did the was there an attack? <laughs> it was so just thrown away. I had to write down what were the lines. Um what was it? Let's see. I think I might have written it down too. Okay. The attempt failed. Uh, Mayax lives. That was the explanation. <laughs> okay. Okay. And well, yeah. and we cut to our friends in a cage. So assumed in the in the fade up and fade down, like a whole battle action sequence of all these people dying. You know, significant plot details like an emotional connection to events just did not take place. Like you could have even had just the bad guys show up at dawn and, and surprise everyone. Yeah. And then that would have been like an understanding, but honestly we don't need it because all we need to know is our friends are in cages and now we've got to save them. Well, it reminded me a lot of Willow um, too mm. where it's like the witch is doing some shit that you don't get and then you're like wait wasn't that the guy that we were supposed to fight and the answer is always no no matter who you <laughs> defeat the answer is always no it wasn't that guy it's gonna be the next guy um but so that he's like okay i'll go save them he goes back to that pyramid they're always at that pyramid just go there yes that's where they are <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it, it, that pyramid is the entire town, and they go there, and there's the final scene where there's a fight at the top, and it's slow, it's not anything that gratifies the last hour and 50 minutes you spent in your life. <laughs> Very gradually, everyone trying to get up the pyramid, It's th there's no running up it, there's no running down it. <laughs> yes, yes. Everyone's um, hot. There's no shade. And by the way, and listeners, this is not the final battle scene. <laughs> right. <laughs> and there's a giant there's, at the end of Conan. There's a giant pyramid, too. Mm -hmm. Yeah. This pyramid, it's not as good as that pyramid. Um, 1982, when, the peak of pyramid rentals. There are like there's so many good lines of like Rip Torn, who like has such a recognizable voice. And yeah. he's just like he's so casual, like. He's just like, kill him, kill him, kill the guy, kill him. Why am I, am I talking to myself out here to kill him? He's like, you've angered R and he wants your babies. And he just says it so casually. so matter of factly, like he's ordering a ham sandwich. Um, but like, fine. All the sexy witches are dead. They finally kill Rip Torn. But at, at what cost? Because oh. one of the adorable but ferrets. Yeah, right. Either Kodo or Podo, it's really hard to tell. One or the no, other. No, Kodo or Podo! <laughs> you were identical. This is now awkward. It, it really is a heartbreaking moment. And they're the most interesting animals. Yeah. Yeah. Because you're always, you're honestly, you're always worried that the other two are going to maul someone. Well, yeah, or just mm. turn on mm. him. Yeah, you're, it's not like, oh, 
the tiger and him have such a great relationship. No, you're like literally watching. It's like, what is the, the thing that's going to snap? The, the, it's like, you know that that animal could snap at any point and just someone would be dead or hurt. And right. so you're always aware of them actually photographing the scene with that tiger. Yeah, yeah, yeah. For sure. Like like the story of how everyone died making Beastmaster. Um, <laughs> <laughs> they did lose one of the ferrets by a bear. in that fire. Yeah. <laughs> right. um, so that, that bear did maul the trainer. Wait, are you being real? Really? Yeah. Uh-huh. Uh-huh. You, gotta, you gotta work on saying facts Oof. like they sound like facts. Fun fact. Fun <laughs> fact. It did? <laughs> that bear did attack its trainer. Everyone God. survived. Okay, I was going to say, is, is he okay? Um, Later in the day, they still shot the scene with the kid. <laughs> <laughs> All right, Thanks. Timmy, don't worry about what happened to Derek. Um, that's once in a thousand shot. Uh, so the gentleman, Mr. Thorne, is going to throw you into the fire. And go. Go. Oh. <laughs> I love it. So, so if the question is like, would you recommend this movie? I think we already sort of nailed that one down by saying, yeah, at, under certain circumstances, right. right? Not necessarily like viewing it for a movie experience, right? But yes, under under many circumstances, it, it can be quite enjoyable. I would recommend this to and someone who already it. started watching it. Like if I walked into a room <laughs> and they're like in the second scene, I'd say, "Oh, Beastmaster, yeah, yeah, hey, Beastmaster's yeah. on." And then, <laughs> yeah, you but sit like down and join that's them. it. That I'd sit down. And I'd go like you know make a grilled <laughs> cheese or something. I'd come back later. <laughs> but that's it. That's how mm -hmm. I would do it. Um, and then so like on a scale of one beast. To ten One. beasts, <laughs> how many beasts would how many you say ferrets? this film it was able to master? Oof. And, Ooh, and a, let's start with one. you, Matt, since you since it's your right. Opinion, it's your, it's right. your fault. I don't then, want your yes. Choices thank you. And by the way, by thanks our... again for having me on the podcast. <laughs> right. We know what you're. Your shame at the end, we want a front load. <laughs> right, right. I'm just a huge Mark Singer fan, and he doesn't get enough credit. Uh, I would say this is a solid oh, two. Oh, man. Oh, he... he... I mean, wow. if this... Oh, if, wow. If, if this didn't have some type of um, effect on people, <laughs> which it clearly has, because, yeah, you could put anything on TV, but there's something about people lingering or staying with something when they could easily just go to the next channel. And for me, what I ultimately like about this is that it's 1980s bad horror movie directing, but the product is a very opposite genre. Because the guy who directed this, Don Cazzarelli, directed Phantasm. And that is very clearly an odd 80s horror movie. So he's taking a lot of that energy into this fantasy that's kind of in a way aimed at kids, even though it's shot very not for kids. So, like, visually, there's things that are very, like, whoa, that sticks with you, which is why it gets two out of ten. But that's me being very generous. <laughs> <laughs> I think that's the lowest score by someone who suggested the movie that we cover, yeah. the history of the podcast. Um, but that makes, makes me feel better about did my I give, score. I might have given Young Guns, which I picked, a, young, a lower score than two. <laughs> is that... I guess mm -hmm. there's only one possibility. Yes. Um, all right. What do you say, Nathan? Uh, I I'm The number, I just kind of like, you just feel it out. I don't use like an empirical method. You just kind of feel like, what is the zone it, it lives in? And I came up with a four, okay. um, which is, again, nice in clips and in moments. Mm -hmm. You know, fun is a backdrop. Mm hmm um, I'm glad I have now seen Beastmaster, but the experience itself was only about a four out of ten, and that's the top of the ceiling. Mm. Mm -hmm. Okay, mm. so I would, I yeah, I I think I agree with four, and I think that's about where I was at. Um, because 
all the reasons you said, Nathan, but I think that you can get what you're looking for in a better way. Like if you want swords and sorcerers, there's there's Conan. Conan exists. Mm-hmm. Red Sonia exists. They're right. even, better. Even, yeah. Even even lesser movies like Conan the Destroyer might be better. Which I've never seen. I've only seen the one. Um, yeah, it, it's there's a big difference between that and Conan the Barbarian. They're well, and I would say level. if you want something that's so bad it's good, then you go crawl. Mm-hmm. Right? Mm. More so, and than you get Liam Master. Neeson, and you get Liam Neeson, and guy a lot getting of British slowly people. crushed. Um, yeah, but but it is a fun, it is a fun movie, and just boy howdy, I'm grateful it exists um, because <laughs> it, it's you know it is what it is, and it doesn't apologize for it. Um, right, none of us may have enjoyed it, but we're all extremely appreciative that Beastmaster exists in the world. Yeah, I did. What, what a strange experience. What a strange I have a question feeling. for the two podcast hosts because this is an 80s movie podcast. And if you remove okay. the fact that this was made in 1982, in your opinion, watching a lot of 80s movies for your podcast, what makes Beastmaster an 80s movie, whether it's successful or not? Ooh. Um,. The cheesiness, the uh, swing for defensiveness, um, the costumes. The kind of like derivative nature of every character and element. Like it's, <laughs> you know, like they bought it in a mail order pack from Europe. Yeah. You know, <laughs> American blockbuster. And, yeah. uh... Um, and and the fact that you can just like you can almost taste the cocaine just <laughs> that's just sprinkled on everything <laughs> in in that world if it's just like people coming from that thing of like well everyone loves Star Wars here's a mm. boatload of money what can you do um, and like people just going for it and, and also I think the eighties had a really interesting thing that I keep circling around to, which is that they hadn't yet figured out that you you get a lot further if your leading man is handsome. Like, they were just like, no, anyone. Anyone. Just get anyone. Mm-hmm. Get anyone and put them in there and, like, don't even make them do that many push-ups. Well, well, well it, I mean, it seems like they cast him... I mean, I felt like in the 80s, they cast a lot of people, and this is maybe Arnold's fault, they cast a lot of buff dudes who couldn't act, but their number one thing was the buff dudeness, you know? Right, but it's like, you can find a hot guy and make him do (laughs) push-ups. I don't know. I I think back in those days, they did. it's like you got a job, and then you you had it in two months, and it's not like they, they... they really had the system of doing this long-term training like they do now. Right. You basically have to hire someone with the whole package. Yeah. Because that, that's what I was saying about Dragon Slayer, too, is, like, could you, couldn't you you find a, someone handsome? Like, what are we doing? <laughs> well, it, about, it very much seems me? like in that – it very much seems like in that 80s way, they really honor the storyboard, and they don't necessarily think, oh, here's our actor – what's the best way to shoot this scene for this actor? It's just, no, here's a storyboard and throw them in there. And like Mark Singer, he's an attractive, like ripped guy, but it's like, it doesn't mesh with the viewing experience of a Conan. Mm. Yeah. And and honestly, at the spectrum of like, of cheesy eighties action, sci-fi fantasy movies, like in the spectrum, like Mark Singer is not at the bottom at all. Like there's way worse in terms of, of stuff that I've seen in terms of like, just like inability to act. <laughs> like he's, he's like, if you put a shirt on him and you put him in another movie, I can see that, you know? Um, what for? But... He did all those crunches. <laughs> but uh, he did all those crunches to wear a shirt, Nathan. I felt like one of the weird thing about the eighties is, 
is none of this. The, you had a good five, ten years where the studio execs were just stabbing in the dark in terms of what nerds wanted. You know, it's like we discovered that there's nerds and they've got mm. money. Star Wars let us know. And they're now just like literally <laughs> making up. I don't know what. They're hiring who, anyone with a bit of confidence who's finished a screenplay, and they're just taking huge stabs at creating mm-hmm. a brand new IP of mythos and mm-hmm. strange sounding names. And they're just they're just swinging for it, but they literally have nothing else to guide them by it. Mm-hmm. You see, like a ton of these in terms of sci fi and fantasy movies, to where it's like, okay, no, no, no. Complicated names, complicated yeah. backstories, complicated at that. That's Just what they add want. More. Just add and they more. They realize that that's not part of it. That's not mm-hmm. that's not the thing that makes it interesting. Yeah, it's like don't don't just add another place with another place name to solve the question. It's like we've only got three places. You've got the pyramid. We've got that place with the hallways. And like that hilltop, mm-hmm. those are the only places. So stop saying there's 102 places when we're only going three places. <laughs> <laughs> so yeah. like, what about deep cut recommendations? Like mm. if you had to pick something like, cause we all know the automatic recommendation. So as soon as Beastmaster, before Beastmaster was even over, Amazon was like, oh, so next you'll be wanting to watch uh he masters of the universe right should i just put that uh, yeah right. i got that recommendation too <laughs> right so what's a slightly uh, more deep cut recommendation yeah the the obvious one like is conan the barbarian like that is that to me is like a, a, a you know a nine out of ten like it is mm-hmm. as good as these 80s sword and sorcery movies get you know, because it, yeah. it takes its characters seriously, and it's and it, it's it, it's a, it's a true. I can't think of really any of these other kind of like loincloth sword movies that mm-hmm. it, that kind of hits as high as as that one. And it, honestly, it's just good storytelling. Um, but I'd say if if you had to go for like the deeper cut, um, and and again, and I preface this with this is a movie that I haven't finished i i've only seen bits of it but oh, no. it it for sure looks it okay so this is fire and ice uh by ralph bakshi but this is basically in the same time period it's the the this the loincloths and swords but it's animated and so they can fi- they can that's the thing that kind of holds most of these back is the budget like you can't do weird backgrounds or or demons or things like that it's kind of like you're taking the lamest parts of these um sword and sorcery Mm -hmm. paintings and that's the only that's the only part we can film is the loin the guys in sweaty loin class and the women in the fur bikinis you know but like fire and ice Mm. they can tell these bigger stories and it it it, the ralph Ralph bakshi you know, animated films, there's the, they're the ones that do the rotoscoping, which is like both eerie and compelling, but yet it's made for adults and it feels like dangerous, you know? And so th- that would be my recommendation if you wanted to go further into this kind of sword and sorcery thing and you've already seen Conan, you know, like 10 times. What's yours, mm. Matt? Uh, so mine is not a movie. Because clearly I have not recommended something that's useful to the human <laughs> society. <laughs> uh, no, my recommendations are two. One, attempt to connect with animals. Because truly, during the pandemic, if it wasn't for my dog, who spent every minute of unemployment with me, uh, there's real connection that one could have with another living being, even if you don't share a language or, mm-hmm. um, you know, currency. Uh, and my other recommendation is parents watch what your seven year old boys are watching on TV. <laughs> it could shape them for better or for worse. It could force, it could force your child to grow up and, 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 and force people to do a podcast about it. Okay. So I have to just jump on that one because my, my son is 10 uh, and he watches things on YouTube that are people playing Minecraft 
And like that's what he's mm. into is watching people on YouTube play Minecraft or yeah. And so and I cannot watch it. Like I don't know what's going on and it makes no sense to me because uh oh. It's just people screaming. It's just squares <laughs> doing things I don't understand and screaming. So so I don't know about that, but um, <laughs> but yes, I, I so I want to recommend something that's also not a movie, which is an, an app. It's a a workout app, an exercise app, uh, which is mm. called a uh, center, but without the E. So it's cool. It's like C E N T R. And it is Chris mm, Hemsworth's okay. app. And uh, this movie made me think of it because it's all very much like it's how it's all like his trainers doing like the things that he does to train. And so that scene where he's like got the log and he's just like swinging the log over his head uh, reminded me of, of one of the exercise moves they have you do. And it's all like, get down on all fours, you're a bear, crawl like a bear. And then it's like, <laughs> take your weights and spin around your head. And um. I use it and I've I've found it to be a very good app. So that would be my deep cut recommendation. If you want to be a guy or a gal in a sword and sorcerer movie, you know, work on those abs uh, the way Chris Hemsworth does. And it's just Chris Hemsworth. There's no other people on the app. Oh, no, it's all other people. Like oh, OK. Our, so we're basically at the end. Uh, I did my recommendation, Nathan, was which is a workout app um, <laughs> for your abs. It's yes, for and it's Chris really? Hemsworth's product, but it's not. It's not Chris Hemsworth doing the workouts. Like sometimes they'll post one of of Chris Hemsworth doing the workouts, but most of the time it's mm. his trainers. And they're and so they're like a lot of them are Australian, but not all of them. Um, but it's a really good app and it, it has like, uh, you know, recipes and things that I don't use. I just do the workouts. <laughs> um, it's called Center without the E, C-E-N-T-R. And that's my recommendation. Um, so, Matt, where can people find the Saturday Night Characters podcast and other um, things that they might be able to uh, enjoy that you participate in? They can find the podcast on iTunes, on Stitcher, or on Spotify, Saturday Night Characters. Every single week, I have a different guest from a different comedy theater somewhere in the country. And the real joy of it is that they choose the character we're going to talk about. And we just have fun. Sometimes we talk about things that are very meaningful personally. Sometimes we talk about things that are like so great. And then you watch it again. And you're like, oh, like this does not age well at all, Stefan. <laughs> but it, it's really great to have people talk about something like SNL that's meaningful to them and to use characters as the doorway that takes you into the world of comedy. And I guess you can find me from, uh, <clears throat> and you can find me at uh, squishy studios, uh, squishy studios.com and the YouTubes and the Facebooks for all of my uh, stupid short films. Anyways, uh, <laughs> Chrissy's mic is just, died on her um sure she could record this all on her own for her own ending but i'm gonna, gonna try ending the episode myself so chrissy did you look at your cable to see if two different ferrets have chewed through it at it all maybe they didn't want you to finish thanks again for listening to the most excellent 80s movie podcast Again, I'm Nathan Blackwell, and my co-host is Chrissy Lenz. I hope this is how they end. I'm not sure if I've even listened to an episode all the way through, um, but uh, I'm joking. She's she's giving me faces on the video chat. Anyways, thanks again, you guys, for listening to us. Remember, rate, review, and like us. It, it does help other people discover the podcast. And remember uh, our saying here at the most excellent 80s movie podcast be excellent to each other and party on dudes party on right. dudes party on. woo air guitar <laughs>